This episode of the QA is brought to you by Rainier Arms. Hey guys, my name is Dave Tim. Thank you very much for checking out this month's episode of the QA. It is October 2017 and I apologize, we're actually so late into the month, but I just had a ton of other stuff going on and we kept getting questions, so that was awesome. Some of the questions I responded to via email or comment because uh, we had to kind of just pick a few to kind of make it to the episode because we got so many, which is awesome. So this month was definitely the busiest as far as questions received, which means that the segment is growing, which is awesome, exact, exactly what we wanted to happen for the series. So we're super excited about that. So before we get rocking and rolling, huge shout out to Rainier Arms for sponsoring this month's episode. And one lucky viewer that submitted a question will be receiving a prize pack from Rainier Arms. So that's awesome. And then also, in order for this to continue to grow, we do need to hear from you. So please leave a comment in the section below and remember to hashtag the QA, or you can email us at the QA at gunsandtactics.com and we'll put the email address right there at the bottom of your screen. It'll also be in the comment section. So here are the questions that uh, we were able to get into this month's episode. And I'm gonna try to condense some of them a little bit. And in fact, some of them were really good where we might do a future briefing room episode about that topic because I thought it was a good topic. So our first question comes from YouTube user Mexican Ninja 82 He's a rookie sheriff's deputy on the border of Texas and Mexico, and he has a patrol AR with an aim point. My question is, what zero do you recommend? Thank you for the great content. Well, thank you for the kind words and submitting your question. I really appreciate that. And in general, my short answer, uh, 50 yards is generally the zero I recommend for most patrol rifles with a red dot. The short why is that 50 yards with no magnification, you can easily see your target to get good consistent hits. Uh, what I found with that, a lot of shooters with vision issues, etc., when they're trying to zero at 100 yards with an aim point, they can't see as well, so their accuracy isn't as good. So a 50 yard gives you good visibility to get that point of aim, point of impact. Additionally, ballistics, uh, 50 yards is a good ballistic zero, generally speaking for most patrol rifles and ammunition, to have an intersection at 50 yards, and then depending on your barrel length velocity, it's usually gonna intersect anywhere from 175 to 225, somewhere in there. And then it's gonna be decent out to about 300 yards with minimal hold, and then if you get beyond that, you might have to hold a little bit. And in my opinion, most patrol rifles, most shooters with a non-magnified optic, positive target identification, things like that, the realistic effective range is probably around three to 400 yards. And before we start the debate of you know people over you know, sees shooting out to this distance and whatever. Yes, I totally get that there, there's those cases. It could be, uh, how, you know, in three gun, I've shot out to five, 600 yards, but it's really asking a lot of that two, two, three round and a lot of the most shooters out there. So I think a 50 yard zero would serve you very well. A 25 yard zero, I'm not a big fan of. Yes, I know it's easier to do and there's better range availability for like, you can do it at pistol bays and things like that, but, um, Trajectory rise, it's just not a beneficial. And then 100 yard isn't bad, uh, you know, but I just prefer 50. I just find that the curve, the arc of the trajectory is just a little bit better for what I think my uses would be with a patrol rifle. So that's what I like as a 50 yard. And in fact, I'm gonna do a separate video on zeroing and we're gonna talk about some ballistics and we're gonna talk about why you would pick a 50 yard zero versus a 100 yard zero, different optic options, things like that. So I think it's a great question. So excellent, excellent question. Uh, AF Raptor 23503 writes on our uh, rifle overview video that we did. What's your opinion on twist rate? Should it be one in seven, one in eight, or one in nine? I realize that the ammo to be used will determine the twist rate, or should it be that the twist rate chooses the ammo? Uh, to answer the latter part first, it's kind of which came first, the chicken or the egg. If you already have a gun, yeah, you might want to find ammo that works best for it, but generally speaking, I prefer a one in seven or a one in eight twist. And what that is for you guys that don't know is uh, one of that number refers to one complete rotation of the bullet in how many inches. So one in seven would be one complete rotation, the rifling of the barrel, you know, rotates the bullet one complete time in seven inches or eight inches or nine inches. And the smaller the number, the faster the twist rate is because the more often it does that. Now, generally, Speaking, the slower twist rates, the one in tens, one in nines, are used for lighter weight projectiles, like 50, 55 grain ammunition. One in eight's kind of a good general. And then the one in seven, uh, old school thinking was that was reserved for like the 62, 64, 69, 75, 77 grain you know, bullets. Now what I found is that there's a lot of good quality barrels out there, the one in eight, one in sevens, that shoot everything pretty dang well. And they'll stabilize those heavier bullets. Now I have seen one in nines not shoot 75 grain, 77 grain ammo very well. It, uh, just, you don't get good performance. And then I've had other guns where they shoot it decent. And I've had other 
you know, uh, some older one in nine 16 inch patrol rifles that actually shot 75 grain duty ammo pretty dang well. So sometimes you're just gonna have to get out and shoot your gun with your ammunition to see what it likes best. But if you're picking a barrel from scratch, I would generally recommend a one in seven or one in eight. It's gonna shoot pretty much every ammunition out there really well. And if you get a quality barrel, it's you know not going to let you down and there's actually another question coming up about barrels uh, that we'll talk a little bit more about you know quality barrels and what i like in a barrel so great question thank you very much uh, next question is from quentin johnson quentin awesome to see you again he's asked questions in previous episodes so i really appreciate uh, the repeat viewers thanks for coming back how do blast cans compare to a flash suppressor or a compensator and then the next part is would they be a good choice for a 14 and a half inch barrel to get it to 16 inches so muzzle device 101, and maybe that is worthy of its own video in the future too, but um, blast cans, muzzle device suppressors, compensators, okay. So a flash suppressor, its job is just to suppress flash, reduce flash. That's its main job. And the most common type is the A2, which is what's standard on most ARs that you'll buy off the shelf. It does a great job at reducing flash. It doesn't do anything necessarily uh, in a lot of shooters perspective to reduce recoil, muzzle rise, etc. But it's just a good flash hider, it's cheap, they're generally good quality items. The AR doesn't have that much recoil anyway. However, uh, that's its main job and there are aftermarket you know, ones on there as well. Then if we look at a compensator, a compensating uh, device that is designed to reduce muzzle rise and felt recoil. And then we also have muzzle brakes, which again, they're a device that is reduced uh, that is designed to reduce muzzle rise and felt recoil. How those muzzle brakes and compensators work, and there is kind of a difference, we can save that for another episode, but how those devices work is they have large ports or vents that take the gas and they exhaust it out of the muzzle device to reduce recoil and muzzle rise. They're, some of them do a good job, some of them are pretty obnoxious to other people around. So if you were on a firing line at a class or in an indoor range or whatever, and some of these compensators, I mean, you almost kind of feel like, you know, man, my cavity is going to come out. You know, they just, they shake and they're, they're just a lot of percussion. I like to call some of them obnoxious comps and I put those guys at the end. They work. They work really good at keeping the rifle flat. And for three gun, I run one. Uh, some of my compensators that I have for suppressor mounts, they work really, really well. Now a blast can is another type of device. And there are some of them that can mount two other muzzle devices, which we'll talk about in a second, or there's some of them like the Noveski KX series. Uh, there's a few other ones too that are basically linear muzzle devices where they direct that flash, the blast, everything forward. Some of them were designed for close quarter situations for law enforcement, military use, where you're shooting amongst or around people and you want all of the percussion to go forward. Other ones were just uh, designed for, you know, maybe a little bit uh, more comfort for hunting without ear protection or shooting like that. So it just kind of depends on the device. Um, and what you know your needs are you know you can do some homework on that but then there are other ones too like uh, suppressor mounts that are compensators well let's say you want to go to a class and not necessarily run a suppressor but you don't want to make the people that are shooting next to you upset you might be able to put a blast can on that and that reduces it in essence turns it into a forward directing muzzle device so those are options as well that's kind of you know in a nutshell now would they be a good choice for a 14 and a half inch barrel to get to 16. Generally speaking, I'm not a fan of pinning and welding. Now, I actually have a project coming up where I'm gonna be pinning and welding a 13.8 inch barrel with a muzzle device. And uh, you know, we'll be talking about the purpose of that and maybe if the, in that future video. But why I'm not a huge fan of it is generally you're saving about an inch to an inch and a half, which in the grand scheme of things is really nothing. You know, I've cleared a ton of buildings, houses, trailers, whatever, with a 16 inch patrol rifle with no issues. You just do this, not a big deal. So not uh, a major concern. Why I generally don't like pinning and welding muzzle devices is because you're married pretty much to the, how that gun is configured. You know, the barrel nut is set, the gas block is set, it's all stuck because it's pinned and welded. Now, yes, you can remove that or whatever, but um, for most people out there, they're stuck with it. So if you ever wanted to change hand guards, can't happen. If you ever wanted to change a gas block, can't happen. If you ever wanted to change a muzzle device, can't happen. You're pretty much stuck with that configuration. Just get a 16 inch barrel, put the muzzle device of your choice and you have that modulator and plus you're not really losing that much. Maybe like about an inch, inch and a half generally speaking. Why would someone do that? Because they want, you know, right at 16 inches and they you know, don't want to go through the short barrel process or maybe they can't because of their state. But generally speaking, I would just say get a 16 inch gun. Um, that's kind of my short answer in a nutshell. If you have more, we can talk and follow through on that. So great, great question. Before we answer the rest of our questions for this episode, we're gonna give a shout out to Rainier Arms for sponsoring this month's episode. Rainier Arms is a great place to go to for all of your firearms and high quality parts needs. 
They have all the cool stuff for your AR, your handguns, your precision rifle, and they carry good quality gear at great prices. However, if you're interested in saving more money, check out the Apex Club. For a low annual price of $79, you get exclusive discounts and availability on cool stuff, plus free ground shipping on all of your orders. The discount and savings on shipping could easily pay for your membership fee with just your first couple of orders. Check out RainierArms.com for more information, and one lucky viewer that submitted a question for this month's episode will receive some prizes from Rainier Arms. Rainier Arms Apex Club sponsored this month's episode, and we sincerely thank them for their support so we can continue to grow the series. All right, next question. This is from Kim Berman from Australia. They sent an email. Uh, they have a question related to training. They live in Australia. They want to come to the U.S. on vacation and take a training class, but they have been told by one company that they're not allowed to. They've been told by another company that they can. Are they? Uh, do you happen to know if I would be breaking any laws if I attend a training session during a vacation uh, visit to the U.S.? They're very limited in basic range shooting down in Australia, and they want to do uh, more about running and gunning. So there is some restrictions on visitors coming to the country and uh, shooting certain items. ITAR restricted items, uh, night vision, certain optics, things like that, lasers, illuminators. Some of those things cannot be in a non-US citizen's hands. So even if you come here legitimately on a vacation or whatever, that you know you shouldn't those are restricted items you can't shoot through them you can't even look through them that's just a no-go however you can come and attend training you can also come and attend a hunting you know get a hunting license and go for a hunting trip or something like that so it is legal however generally uh, speaking what i recommend is get a hunting license if you look at the statute and there is actually regulations on the atf web page about uh, visitors with firearms and one of the exemptions that they list there is with a hunting license so a lot of times what i've recommended is to work with a good quality instructor get a hunting license it's usually pretty inexpensive uh, for just a basic small game or something like that and then that would help you know suffice some of the legal stuff and then you can take a training class assuming that you're not going to be handling or looking through any restricted items so it is legal uh, there's certain gray area because the statute or the, the federal guideline is not you know absolutely clear it's a little gray and depending on how you interpret it but don't be afraid to work with a quality instructor. Make sure they reference that and uh, you should be just fine. So great question. Awesome to see questions coming from Australia, which is great. All right, just a couple more here. This one is a comment on our patrol rifle setup video from Koa Vo. What's your opinion on stainless steel versus non-stainless barrels on a 16 inch platform? Is the trade-off of higher accuracy from a stainless steel barrel worth the extra weight and decreased barrel life? So generally speaking, yeah, stainless steel is accurate. They uh, handle machining very well, so they can have nice, accurate rifling, which in turn leads to accurate rifles. However, they wear out a little bit faster compared to their chrome line counterparts, and sometimes they are heavier depending on the profile. So if you were building a gun that you wanted, you know, for sure accuracy or whatever, yeah, get a stainless steel barrel. They're great. And for most shooters out there, they're never going to shoot three, 4,000 rounds through the life of that rifle. Whereas, you know, for a lot of serious students, um, you know, guys like me, trainers, whatever, you know, three, 4,000 rounds, that could literally happen in a month. So it kind of depends on what your goal of that rifle is. So is it worth it? Uh, well, yeah, it could be worth it. However, I would also say this, is that there are a lot of chrome line barrels on the market that are awesome shooters. Now, my two favorite lines of chrome line barrels right now uh, for like, you know, patrol rifles, duty type rifles, whatever. The Rainier Arms, I know it's a shameless plug because they're sponsoring the show, but I, I've used these barrels long before they, I had any business relationship with them. The Mountain Series chrome line barrels, awesome, awesome shooters. I've had several of them come through the shop. We've built them for you know guys, and we've had several shooters report, and I've had myself with mine uh, with duty, good ammo, you know, getting one inch groups at 100 yards or under, and that's awesome shooting. You know, that's really, really awesome shooting. And these are with like low magnification or red dots and that kind of stuff. So they're capable of really good accuracy. The other chrome line barrels that I really like are the Criterion chrome line barrels. Criterion claims to have a unique chrome lining process that uh, eliminates deviation because that's traditionally been the problem in the past is that with chrome lining, there can be, you know, voids and buildups and excess of chrome lining where you have the chrome lining a little thicker here than here. And that would cause the bullet to, uh, you know, wear a little bit different as it travels down the barrel and have some accuracy issues. But Criterion claims to have a unique chrome lining process that preserves accuracy. And the chrome lined Criterion barrels that I have, I have a few of them from my friends at Midwest Industries. They are shooters. I mean, serious shooters. I have uh, a chrome lined barrel in my uh, 308. I have a chrome lined barrel um, in a couple of 5.56 guns from Criterion. And 
I've been really impressed. I mean, stainless steel accuracy out of a chrome line barrel. So if you're looking for a good accurate barrel, maybe you don't want to spend the money on a stainless, but you're still looking for that long barrel life and accuracy, check out the Criterion. You can get them from all sorts of different places. I happen to get them from Midwest because I like those guys over there, but there's different profiles and stuff available or the Rainier Arms Mountain Series. Great, great barrels. Otherwise, there's ton of good stainless barrels on the market as well. So great question. Our last question is from Brandon, and this one is key mod versus M-Lock. And I, I gotta be honest, I debated about not putting this in here because this topic has been beat to death. But here's my short answer on it. And uh, I guess it's not even gonna be that short. Going back to when we had quad rails, then we had the tube style where you had to get the little Picatinny pieces. And if this tube was from company A and you had another rail that was from company B, that Picatinny piece wouldn't work. So there's all this scatter, you know, it was just a, you know, it was cool because there was, you know, didn't have to have these big heavy quad rails, but I'd have to buy a rail piece and then put my light on or put a rail piece and then put my grip or whatever. So then when key mod came out, it was awesome because we had a standard and no matter what, you know, as long as it was done to spec, it was good. Now there was issues with polymer and some people reported strength issues, but I had good quality key mod gear with the recoil lug because there was some cheap crap out there that wasn't made to spec and they had issues with that. But I've, I ran key mod pretty much since it came out and I had zero issues. Uh, I didn't even have any issues of braking even in duty capacity or whatever. I've had stuff come loose, you know, so it's important to always lock tight and properly torque. But uh, key mod has, for the most part, held up really well for me and I liked it because it was a, a system where I didn't have to buy rail pieces. I could just take that accessory and mount it right to the rail and it was nice and sleek and it worked really, really well. So that was awesome. However, I do think M-Lock is a better platform and it's been scientifically proven. I know there was the military studies that had drop testing and impact studies and things like that. Uh, I do think M-Lock is the better platform. Am I gonna dump my key mod stuff? Nope, but as time evolves and I'm you know, switching stuff out or getting new stuff, I'm gonna eventually evolve everything that I can to M-Lock and just kind of standardize on that. So I think M-Lock is probably gonna take over the industry, even you know, companies that were traditionally you know, firm, you know, line in the sand, we're key mod, key mod, key mod, even they have come out with M-Lock stuff now. So I, I do think it's kind of going to be the new industry standard. Uh, being that the military is adopting it, that really helped. It's, it's very similar to the Blu-ray HD DVD or, you know, VCR, uh, VHS Betamax debates or whatever. It's just kind of which platform the industry adopts. And I think really the industry moving forward has pretty much adopted M-Lock. So moving forward, I'm not saying anything bad about key mod, but M-Lock, you know, it was a pretty sweet system. And there's more and more cool accessories and rails coming out with, you know, M-Lock options now too. So that's really neat. So that will do it for this month's episode. And this was awesome. We got several questions, awesome, good quality questions. And we also had other questions that didn't make it to the show where I was able to reply to via email or comment. And again, just because we only had so much time. So, but because Rainier Arms is awesome enough to sponsor this month episode, we are gonna give away some prizes that Rainier is gonna send to one lucky viewer that submitted a question. So of the six questions that made it to the episode, we are gonna do a random number generator and pick a winner. And it is number two. So that would be AF Raptor 23503 YouTube comment. So AF Raptor or AF22 Raptor 23503, please email us at the QA at gunsandtactics.com. We'll get your contact info and make sure we get your prize pack sent out. So again, if you have questions, please send them to us at the email address shown below, or you can leave a comment in the comment section and remember to hashtag the QA. Thank you guys very much for watching this month's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and check us out online, gunsandtactics.com. We look forward to seeing you at future videos. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day.